This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 319, recorded on January 9th, 2015. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me here today in the TWIV studio, Dixon Despommier. Hello there, Vincent. Good afternoon, Professor. Thank you. Good How afternoon. be it you? It, uh, I'd be fine, thanks. It is zero degrees Celsius here. It is. We are up from minus 14 earlier this week. Yep. We got a cold snap, as they say, right, Dixon? The wind has slowed down a bit. Oh, the wind here is ridiculous, as uh, Alan will attest to when we get him on. Dixon, are there ice? Is the is the river no, icing up? Not yet. Not yet. It's uh, we're, the river water is too warm for that yet. There has to be more heat exchange. How many weeks of minus freezing? A uh, couple. Couple weeks. Yeah. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Are you freezing too? Well, actually, it would be good to be someplace else. Yeah. <laughs> It's very well yeah. today. Today it's up to thirty Fahrenheit minus one C. That's not um, so bad. Which is balmy. You remember uh, how windy it is here, Alan? Right. Oh yeah, yeah. You've, you've got it howling past the windows now, so right? We're right on that. Yes, the, we recorded Twip on Wednesday, right? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. howling. Yeah. But you know, it's we're right on the river. The other night we, I was walking to the car and my face hurt. Yeah, I know it hurts you too, but <laughs> it hurt me. <laughs> it was killing you, right? I preempted yeah, we, you. <laughs> you, you. You beat me to it. That's all right. As long as you're smiling, it could be a frozen smile. Okay, moving on. Also joining us today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. How are Hello, you? Hello, Kathy. Hello. Okay. Cold? Cold. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's does, talking about the weather, but no one's doing Nobody does anything, anything about, about it. Right. What's your temperature at the moment? So we're 13 Fahrenheit minus 11 C. Wow. Not bad. Yeah. And yesterday? Yesterday, we were a low of minus 17 up to minus 11 C, or uh, minus 2 Fahrenheit to 12 Fahrenheit. Snow on the ground? So far, I'm winning. We got to minus 20 C. (laughs) No. Uh, We uh, had a little snow two days this week also, an inch each day. Oh, we had more than that. You had more snow? Oh, yeah. So is it starting to crinkle yet as the result of the very cold weather? (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, it was warmer than that yesterday at McMurdo Station in Antarctica. <laughs> well, because it is summer, summer there. Sure, of course. Okay. 30 well, degrees Fahrenheit, minus one Celsius. Also joining us today from north central Florida, Rich Condit. Right. Howdy, everybody. Now, no one wants to talk to you because we know what the weather's like. Oh, it's <laughs> freezing down here. It's really cold. Right. I, I can hardly stand it. It's uh-huh. 56. <laughs> What? Thir- uh, 13 Celsius. Occasionally it does freeze 13? down there, right? It actually froze night before oh last. Goodness. Yeah, I remember you telling Are us Are the that. orange groves in danger? Uh, yeah. You know, most of the orange groves that were anywhere in danger are gone. Okay. You, 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 okay. Uh, I used to see orange groves all the way down to Orlando, and now you just don't see them anymore. A little south of Orlando, they pick up again because it's just too risky. Interesting. Hmm. All right, we have a follow-up or two. Ana Fernandez Sesma, who's at Mount Sinai, writes, Hi, Vincent. Today we are having the first group of PhD candidates visiting, and half of them heard about us in TWIV. Thanks for doing such a great job. So if you remember, Mount Sinai took out a bunch of ads for their PhD program. Right. And it works. How about and that? a student of mine is going down there to interview next week. Nice. So... Oh. You know, it's not very expensive to advertise on TWIV, and it helps A couple hundred thousand us. dollars is all it'll take. <laughs> no, Dixon, it's just wrong. Is that, what it, What does it? Okay, I won't well, we, we have a schedule, but uh, other programs should consider. I think Mount Sinai was very forth looking to do this. They're doing yeah. something out of the box. This is told, nobody's done this before. How about that? Adver- you, can, uh, you can advertise your graduate program in, I don't know, Science Magazine or whatever, yeah, but yeah, on yeah. a podcast, who's done that? I think huh. it's great. And they picked the time period of all the Ebola excitement. Yeah. Yes. yes. So nice. they really got the twin bump. Nice. Got lots of listeners. They got a bargain. And, and if you pay extra, we can make sure that there will be a major virology story breaking out. Right. When, <laughs> That's right. We'll find That's something. a lot extra, though. Sea stars. It's a very yes. lot extra. Yeah, right, right, right. 
Okay, John writes, quoted in TWIV 318, Ron Fouché predicted a lab-acquired infection rate of less than once per million years. Anybody who takes that seriously should read Richard Feynman's appendix to the Rogers Commission report on the loss of the space shuttle Challenger. NASA managers claimed a 1 in 100,000 chance of failure per shuttle launch. Feynman observed that the historic failure rate of solid rocket motors over thousands of launches was 1 in 25, but improving. Over its lifetime, the shuttle had a 1 in 63 failure rate. Reliability of complex systems is estimated by extrapolation. It's engineering, not math. I used to work on development of a big, complicated medical printer. We ran thousands and thousands of sheets through it, and every time it failed, somebody recorded the details of the failure. The printer was only as reliable as experience proved. With good statistics, you can see where the design flaws are. You fix the worst problem, and the second worst problem gets a promotion. A plot of failure rate versus time shows a decreasing trend. The right end of that curve is your current reliability. Labs full of humans are complicated systems and should also be judged by experience. When smallpox was studied more often, workers were infected. A decade ago, there were cases of lab-acquired tularemia. Just 15 minutes earlier in episode 318, Ebola was handled at BSL-2 instead of BSL-4. Each incident is less serious than the previous. That's good. On the other hand, many lab-acquired infections must go unnoticed or unreported. Most viral, vile mishandling incidents don't make the New York Times. I think we can say, based on experience, that the chance of lab-acquired infection at BSL-3 or 4 is greater than 1 in a million per year. If there is a proof to the contrary, I am prepared with this oft-cited statement by computer scientist Donald Knuth when he sent a new program to a co colleague. Quote, beware of bugs in the above code. I have only proved it correct, not tried it. <laughs> John. P.S. It's minus 16C in the suburbs of Boston, headed for minus 20. Yeah, it's just, and this just came in yesterday, so Alan is, we, this vouches yes. for what Alan said. That's right. So, he says, so I think that's a really nicely reasoned letter. Yeah, it's you know? true. Very good. Now, the point is that the opposite side, um, who, who Fouché was responding to, Lipsitch and et al., had it far, far more frequent. So, you know, it's somewhere in between. Yeah, that's why I like this letter. It's kind of a middle ground <clears throat> saying, you know, look at, look at both sides, and, but, but trust, trust experience. I, some of his uh, sentences uh, uh, in here are really good. When the worst problem, if you fix the worst problem, the second worst problem gets a yeah, promotion. It's a promotion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah but I, th I think Fouché's point was, um, you know, gee, we can all sit around and pick extreme numbers. Um, yeah. But it's not it's not as risky as the naysayers would say nor necessarily as uh as perfectly safe as some would believe it's not perfectly safe but right. um uh well we're going to talk about this in two weeks i've decided that we need to have an episode on this potential pandemic blah blah issue <laughs> i don't like any of the words that have been thrown around but um we're going to have paul dupre join us and we'll go through what's happening Okay, so cool. We'll, we'll debate it. And uh, fortunately, Rich Condit will not be with us. Because uh, mm. he's a busy guy. <clears throat> I forget okay. what I'm doing. I think, oh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to Seattle. Stu study section? No, that's not until February. What date is this? We're talking about two, two weeks, weeks from, from now? Today, yeah. uh, two weeks from today. I'm on my way to Seattle to see my new grandson. Yeah. Okay, there that's you go. good. So, uh, uh, Paul, uh, who, John also had. This uh, reference in here, uh, Catastrophe, Risk, and Response by Richard Posner, mm -hmm. worth pointing out. Yes. Yeah, we'll put those in. And, and he also linked to the Feynman, the Rogers Commission report. All right. Now, that's the paper we're doing today was suggested by Justin, who wrote uh, not too long ago. Uh, he sent us a link to uh, the paper, and he said, this looks pretty promising. And the paper is published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it's called Efficacy of a Tetravalent Dengue Vaccine in Children in Latin America. And I believe it's open access, so if you want to play along at home, you can. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there are many, many authors. The first author is Luis Villar, and the last author is Fernando Noriega. For the CYD15 study group, so the authors aren't even all listed at the right. A complete list of investigators is provided in the supplementary appendix. 
page, all these things get bigger and bigger. If you want to see a long document, you look at the <laughs> Ayaku, the, um, uh, the, uh, the institutional document for this. Man. You know it's a major clinical trial when they they send you to the supplementary data for the author list. It's amazing, right. isn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. Dixon and I did a paper on TWIP this week where one of the authors was a consortium, remember? Exactly. At that I've never seen before. That's it was some right. microbiome That's consortium, right. which must have so many people vaginal in it. Vaginal microbiome. The consortium. vaginal microbiome consortium. So they must have so many people that they couldn't exactly. listen to them. You know, this is nothing when you go read a paper in physics. Or genetics. Or the, genetics. The genome sequences, right. I think, yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorsha. Right. That's right. Things so are changing. It makes you wonder how you build a career based on the fact that you're one of 83 authors. Yeah. And how could you divide up the workload among those it's people hard. in fair Well, you have to, you know, in a fair the first way. author is first author for a reason. I understand. And then you have to have a paper where you're the first author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but, but not all these people need to have first author papers. You I know? guess not. Anyway, dengue virus. Right. A mosquito-borne virus. Indeed. It goes from... What kind of mosquito, Dixon? It's a tree-hole breeding mosquito called Aedes aegypti Aedes. and other related... Uh, and, yeah, other related. All right. So, it, um, mosquito-borne, 390 million infections estimated every year. Yep. 96 million of which have some sort of clinical manifestation. And the incidence has been increasing, no, showing no sign of decline. You know, at one point a long time ago... It was uh, declining because of the use of DD. DDT. Yes, Alan, are you listening? <laughs> I certainly am, yes. And then when that stopped, it went went up, and it still goes up. So we need a vaccine. Right. And the, the, other the, thing is that the DDT thing was largely part of the malaria eradication campaign, yeah, right. and I think right. you probably know how that went. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, this is the mosquito that carries yellow fever, too, and they cleaned up the area without the use of insecticides or vaccines or anything else, and the Panama Canal got built. So you can um, reduce the incidence of infections carried by Aedes if you know where it breeds. Well, and it's worth pointing out that um, if you look at areas where you have a, uh, a wealthier country next to a poorer country, right. Um, in a tropical area, you can look at the border and see that the wealthier country gotcha. often has drastically lower rates of dengue gotcha. fever than the poorer country. Um, sure. So, and it's not it's not necessarily because of some systematic public health effort. It's because with wealth come houses that are bug proof, and people spend more time inside them, and they're more likely to be you know having air conditioning and driving around in cars. Yeah. Um, and so this is this is one of many diseases of poverty, but apparently we can't fix that, so we're looking for a vaccine. Yep. There are four serotypes, and importantly, uh, infection with one does not confer immunity to the other three. And In fact. It, it can make it worse, as we yep. will see. Now, you can be infected, and you can have an asymptomatic infection. You can have a mild, nonspecific, flu-like illness. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you can have... A classic dengue fever, uh, which is accompanied by mm, pain in the bones and joints, right? That's right. Break, Break bone, bone fever. fever. Break bone fever. Or you can have severe dengue, in which case you get plasma leakage, hemorrhage, and possibly death. And this, mm. when you get infected with a different serotype, you have increased risk for this severe disease. And I think we've talked about this a few times we before have. on TWIV. The mechanism isn't known, but it's thought to be antibody-mediated enhancement uh, of infection mm. and a so-called cytokine storm. So the idea is that you, you develop with the first infection, you develop antibodies against the virus, and then the second infection with a different serotype, those antibodies aren't good enough to protect you against it, but they do bind to it, which opsonizes it and gets it into more cells. Right. That's so, the idea, anyway. So a vaccine has to protect against all four serotypes. Correct. Not only that, but it has to do it, yeah, has to do it in a balanced fashion if possible. I mean, you don't want to, oh, I guess just saying all four is important because if you yeah. leave one out, then then you're potentially exposing a, a person to a worse situation than yeah. they were in to start with. That's right. So should we should we run down the basics on this virus? Yeah, sure. For, so that's a positive-stranded, single-strand RNA virus enveloped. Right, with uh, glycoprotein in the envelope and a uh, long plus strand in RNA genome, flavivirus. Yes. And right. interesting feature is that there's an underlying capsid uh, mm. 
and that helps provide some structure to the uh, envelope. And so it's a really complicated looking virus. It, it almost looks non-enveloped to me from the outside mm -hmm. in, in right, terms right. of uh, uh, classroom type diagrams. Right. In, in yeah, in words, particular because the, the major glycoprotein, the uh, e-glycoprotein, the way it's arranged covers pretty much the whole surface. And in an orderly fashion. So you're right. It looks like it's a regular capsid in some ways. So uh, a vaccine has been worked on for many, many decades. And it's difficult for a number of reasons. There isn't a good uh, animal model. There isn't a good human infection model. Um, so it's been tricky. But now, as we will see, there are um, at least this set of vaccine candidates, a quadrivalent vaccine has been tested and the, this has already gone through a number of previous uh, testings because what we're going to talk about today is a second phase three trial. Uh, but we did, I think we talked about the phase 2B efficacy trial that, that uh, was done in Thailand. And um, this showed pretty wide variation in efficacy. Overall, 30%, which is not very good. Serotype 1 was 56%. Serotype 2, 9%, which is basically nothing. And ser serotype 3, 75%. And serotype 4 was 100%. Uh, um, the, the, the other phase 3 trial, which uh, we didn't cover and which has already been published, was conducted in five Asian countries. And again, it involved children 2 to 14 years old. Overall, 56% efficacy. 50% for serotype 1, 35 for serotype 2. So better, but still not good. I don't think that was better than the control. Right. Do you, do you know right offhand how many children were involved in each of those trials? No, I don't. A no, lot. A lot. This, one, this one is 20,000. Yeah, yeah, and it's incredible how big these are. Yeah, I think, the, I think the Asian trial was of a similar scale. Um, and in these, so the phase two trial was, the 2B trial was obviously very disappointing. Um, but I gather they changed, they, they changed a little bit in their strategy. And also they're looking at some endpoints that, may make a difference depending on uh, uh, how you want to define the problem. Yeah. Um, so you could say that the vaccine works for certain values of works. Um, and so the, the Asian trial found an overall efficacy of something like 56%, but then if you look at efficacy against severe dengue, it goes up just about 80%. Yeah. So, so people were people were most most of the people who get this virus get a mild illness or no symptoms, but then um, a subset of them develop severe dengue, which is the, the hemorrhagic, yeah. really nasty. So I should say these percentages that I'm telling you is prevention of virus, confirmed uh, viral infection. Right. Right. So that's just looking at whether you can isolate virus from the individuals or not. And then there was also, as Alan said, a consideration of protection against a severe disease, which was uh, hospitalization actually in the, three, in the Asian phase three trial was 80%, and severe dengue was 95%. So I want to uh, make sure we cover what the vaccine itself is, because that's yep, interesting. Yep, we're going to do that yes. next. Yep. Okay. So the vaccine, <clears throat> you want to do that, Rich? You can do sure. it. Sure. Go ahead. So uh, dengue as a flavivirus is in the same family as yellow fever virus. And uh, so the genome structure, the overall structure of the virion are very, very similar. Um, there are a number of uh, different other flaviviruses, for example, Japanese encephalitis, etc. Uh, and uh, there is a yellow fever virus vaccine, which is an attenuated vaccine. So that was attenuated by passaging uh, in culture, and he came up with a live virus that uh, could infect and induce immunity but not cause disease, and it's been a very successful vaccine over decades. And since the structure is very similar to dengue, all you have to do is to take out the antigenic components, the two glycoproteins, which are the genes are PRM and E, and swap those out of the yellow fever virus uh, vaccine backbone and substitute them for the equivalent dengue virus proteins for each of the four serotypes. So now you have four viruses with the uh, envelope proteins in the yellow fever vac uh, backbone for each of these four guys. The, the vector itself was developed as something called Chimera Vax, but it's now called more generically uh, CYD. Um, <laughs> importantly, there's um, uh, there is so this is a recombinant viral vectored vaccine. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. There is only one such vaccine licensed in humans in the world, and that is uh, the same vector, uh, and it's in use for Japanese encephalitis. Not licensed in the U.S. yet. I think it's Japan and Australia or something like that. <clears throat> and so were this to get licensed, it would be the same, uh, uh, the second such vaccine. There are plenty of uh, recombinant vaccines that have been licensed for veterinary use. So this, these vaccines that Rich described have been extensively tested before. They were first shown to generate neutralizing antibodies in an animal. Then they were tested in non-human primates, and then now they're, they've gone into people. There's another sort of testing that's very interesting, because at some point, this is kind of, kind of an aside, but it's an interesting one. Uh, uh, people have some concerns sometimes about the possibility that recombinant viruses could interact with wild-type viruses and cause, recombine with them. Hmm and cause some sort of problem. And that challenge was raised uh, on the Camara vac- vaccine very early on. And the people who were developing a vaccine took that seriously and did a number of very interesting tests uh, to show that um, basically the probability of recombination is with these types of viruses is near zero on the under the best of circumstances. And if you can force it to recon combine or construct a recombinant that uh, anticipates what you might expect, you find that that thing basically is dead. Mm-hmm. Okay, so right. the, it's been through a lot of safety testing. So you'd say it, it might happen once per one million years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I just wanted to, this is not really relevant to the main scientific discussion, but I just wanted to call out um, this one paragraph, they, they spend a paragraph describing who knew what and when. Uh, the sponsor of the study, Sanofi Pasteur, designed it, performed the sample testing, analyzed the data, and then they talk about who had access to which data. Um, and they point out, and this is the first time I've seen this, actually. The first draft of the manuscript was written by a medical writer employed mm-hmm. by Medicom Consult with funding from the sponsor and all authors provided critical input for successive drafts, um, which is a trend that I, I think is very good because a lot of the papers that you read in the literature were actually ghostwritten, um, and it's not so much a question of crediting the writer as knowing where the money for the writing came from. Interesting, yeah. Mm. So right. I'm I'm pleased that they that there's this move toward transparency in that aspect of it. Yeah. I guess with such a big study that instead of arguing over who's going to write it, you just hire someone. Oh, you'd have to. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. A few details on the vaccine just so you know what's going on here. So they're combined into one uh, preparation, all four serotypes, which is injected subcutaneously above the deltoid. That would be this, right, Dixon? Yep. My shoulder here. That would be that. Same place you get a flu shot. Flu shot. Except uh, that's... Yeah. And there was, Moscow, what, like Moscow. 10 to the 5th PFU of each? Yeah. Cell culture, inf- cell culture infectious doses. That's how they're measuring it. Okay. Not PFU. And the placebo is 0.9% sodium chloride solution. Now, I assume at some point um, they've looked at or, or tested what the proportions of these serotypes might be in the vaccine. Uh, they they're mixing them as I understand it in uh, equal amounts in, in equal terms amounts of, and then, in terms of infectivity because I, yeah. I mean in this case we see much lower response to to serotype two you know that might be some place to go with expanding this you know when they were testing the polio vaccines they had some uh, uneven responses and they played with mm-hmm. the proportion so yeah. that might be something worth doing here but they haven't yeah you know, they're equal as as Rich says yeah. All right, so the kids, just to give you an idea of all the work involved in this, and there are um, 20,869 children. They're, they are scheduled for visited, visits at month 0, 06, and 12 for vaccination and month 13 for follow-up and blood sampling. In addition, they're contacted by telephone or had a home visit at months 18 or, and 25. Mm-hmm. There's a separate cohort of children a subset of the whole trial who are who are followed for reactogenicity and immunogenicity. They're, they have visits at months 1, 7, and 13, and blood samples from them are obtained at months 0, 7, 13, and 25. They use those to test for dengue serotype-specific antibodies, so they don't test everybody for this. And what they do is they do a plaque reduction neutralization test and a 50% reduction in the plaque count. 
And all of this is being done uh, simultaneously in five countries at multiple medical centers in most of those. those Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Honduras. Mm-hmm. It must be quite an effort to get standardization of those assays from all those different sites. Yes, from all those centers and across all those regulatory authorities. Yep. I thought uh, it says the assessment was performed in a central laboratory. That would make and sense. so oh, I right, assumed yes. that that meant that one would, place. That but would make sense. Ah, that right. would make so, sense. So they had, one, they had one lab for all the lab testing. Yep. Yeah. It was about uh, 10% of the children that were followed for the uh, immunogenicity and reactogenicity, and that comes up later. And also, everybody was contacted weekly uh, and reminded to be taking their temperature and what to do if they Mm -hmm. had a Mm -hmm. higher temperature than 38 Celsius and so forth. So, it was, it's a lot of work. Yeah, it's amazing. So, any kid who had an acute febrile illness, they got two blood samples um, to confirm the presence of dengue. So they did a RT-PCR test, uh, also an antigen assay, to say whether these are virologically confirmed dengue or not. And then they would record clinical symptoms and so forth. Okay, So it just adds to the work. It must be a huge data set. Yeah. Okay, 20,869 children, 9 to 16 years old. 13,920 got the vaccine. 6,949 received the placebo. And to, as Kathy said, 2,000 of these were assigned to the reactogenicity and immunogenicity subgroup. I want to be part of that subgroup, mm-hmm. <laughs> the RNI subgroup. Uh, and then they break it down by country. Um, they break each, each set down by country, obviously. Or the 95% of the participants received all three injections. So for various reasons, you can be removed from the test. You can make a violation in some way. You know, there are all kinds of protocol violations that are listed in the protocol. And if you fulfill that, you know, you're, you're kicked out. Some some of the kids don't show up. Their parents don't bring them anymore and so forth. So 95% is pretty good. It's okay. amazing. Yeah. What happened? They had a total of 10,053 febrile episodes. This is now looking at uh, virologically confirmed dengue. And uh, they diagnosed dengue in 668 episodes among 662 children. Did you say what their criteria for positivity was? Yeah, yeah. It's RT-PCR yes, yes. or ELISA. Yes. Either one was enough. Okay. Yeah, that's the WHO uh, criteria. Yeah, yeah. If, if any test was positive, it's classified as dengue. Um, so the number was... Um, so that's actually uh, about that's a, about six percent of the febrile episodes were uh, virologic, virologically confirmed dengue. Right, that's what you want because these are areas where dengue is endemic, and you need right. to do the test in that area so you can see what happens. Yep. All right, so then they analyze the data in t- in two ways. There, and these are two terms that I don't think we've dealt with before one of them is called per protocol analysis and this is basically everyone that's gone through all three immunizations is remains with the protocol to the end you can ask what was the uh, vaccine efficacy so uh, overall it was 60 percent in this per protocol group and then they have a separate group which is called intention to treat analysis and this you, you you look at everybody no matter whether they completed the entire course or not so anybody who started the program. Anybody who started, you got at least one immunization. Um, you, you look at them, okay, and that pro, that efficacy is 64.7%, so slightly higher. And the reason you do both is because sometimes when people drop out of a trial, it can bias the results because they may be dropping out for specific reasons that are confounding. So you right. like to do both analyses. The other interesting thing about that is that if you uh, focus on a cohort of dropouts, you might get some information as to whether a single immunization is sufficient yeah. or whether you really need three. Exactly. So, yeah. so there can be very interesting and informative stuff in looking at the intention to treat uh, as opposed to the per protocol. Right. Okay, so the highest efficacy was for serotype 4 which was um, 83.7%. Uh, uh, you, maybe you intended on doing this later, but I want to point out that uh, most of these kids, 90, uh, 
uh, no, uh, about 75 to 80 percent of them mm. had yes. seen dengue before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, got, we have to discuss that. But so they're yeah. So they're most of the kids are seropositive to at least one of the four subtypes. Sometimes more than one. Yeah. And uh, so that could they discuss this, and in that fact becomes, they split out the seropositive and yeah. seronegative guys. Mm. <clears throat> So the efficacy in the two age groups uh, for serotype four eighty three point seven percent compared with forty three point two percent. So these are children who had antibodies at baseline, forty three point two percent who did not. Okay, so that's the difference, and and it varied according to the country, which they discuss later may have something to do with how many kids were. Uh, already seropositive, what serotypes are circulating, I don't really know, but it did vary from country to country. 17 hospitalizations for virologically confirmed dengue after at least one injection, and that is in the vaccine group, compares with 43 hospitalizations in the control group. So you can just see that that looks good. Mm. It's 80, 80% Eight, vaccine 80%, yeah. <laughs> efficacy. Yep. And all four serotypes were found in these hospitalized kids. Um, and, f- and overall, fewer kids in the in the vaccine group had any kind of hemorrhage, visceral manifestations, or plasma leakage. Right. So it's, uh, the um, uh, protection, the efficacy against severe dengue was ninety five and a half percent. Right. So that's the next. That's twelve cases of severe dengue. So the right. ones we're talking about right now are not severe. These are just they're just hospitalizations. Yeah. yeah. So there was one in the de- vaccine group and eleven in the control group. Okay, this is for severe dengue. So again, you can see that that's, that looks pretty good without even calculating uh, the 95.95.5%. And these 11 patients had dengue hemorrhagic fever. They were diagnosed with it. So um, this looks pretty good for the, for the severe dengue. Okay, how about um, safety reactogenicity? And immunogenicity, serious adverse events within 28 days were reported in 121 children, 81 in the vaccine group and 40 in the control group, 0.6% in both. Right. So no difference. No difference. No deths. So the rate, rate Actually, some kids died during the study, but none of right. those deaths were attributable to the vaccine. Not during this period of 28 days anyway. Right. Yeah. Accidents and... Right. Yeah. So most of these adverse events Malaria. were infection and injury not related to uh, vaccination, but you have to record it, obviously. Uh, mm-hmm. for, sorry, Dixon? No, no, I was just going to comment yeah. that only 6% of the febrile illnesses were due to dengue. That means 94% was due to something else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And, and there are a lot of things out there that can make you feverish. So, yeah. And malaria is the biggest one of the ones that... Weren't mentioned. Yeah, you, you make me feverish, Dixon. Really? <laughs> That's nice of you to say that. Four serious adverse offense were considered vaccine-related. Three in the vaccine group, mm-hmm. asthma attack, a rash, a polyneuropathy associated with viral meningitis, mm-hmm. and one in the control group. And a fifth ad- ad- adverse event in the vaccine group was some, or some seizures. 18 hours after the first injection, but it says without detectable vaccine virus in samples. I don't know what that means. Does anyone, the seizure, I guess the samples from the individual didn't have vaccine virus in them. I don't know. It's it's a sort of an oblique way of saying we really don't think maybe this has anything to do with the vaccine. Right. 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 And And all, all of the kids with those serious adverse events recovered. Right. And so then finally, the, um, the last thing they report is that the titers of antibodies against each serotype increased ex- after vaccination in the, in the vaccine group, but not in the control group. Mm-hmm. And of course, the increases were greater in the kids who were previously seropositive. But um, this is... Pre- you say, of course, because you're thinking of it as being like a boosting kind of thing? Sorry, I, I shouldn't say that. Yeah, but I'm thinking it's like a, it's a memory response, right? Okay. Right. But that's what they, in fact, observed. Increases were lower than those in children with seropositive status in the uh, in the ones who were negative at baseline. Um, this this is similar among all four serotypes. We should point out. So this is important because the the titers, which are measured by a virus neutralization assay in cell culture, are pretty good against all four serotypes. But as we saw, the um, the the protection wasn't good against 
um, type 2. Actually, it wasn't even in this section. We're going to see this in the discussion. Let's see. Here's the vaccine efficacy. No, it's in table 3. Table 3. Yeah. So the, let's look at the per-protocol analysis. Serotype 1 vaccine eff- efficacy is 50%. Serotype 2 is 42%. Serotype 3, 74 And uh, serotype 477, that's the vaccine efficacy. So, you know, th- two is the worst, which is mm. substantially different. And then the last, um, the other trial the um, in the Asian countries, I think it was 34%, which was deemed not different from control. And here it's it's statistically different, but it's still 42% is not where you'd like to be, I think, right? Right. right. And they saw um, higher efficacy um in addition to higher antibody titers, that had higher efficacy in kids who were seropositive right. to start with. That's right, and that was that was significant. It is, yeah. So it's um, it, the ones who were seropositive to start with, um, they had eighty three point seven percent efficacy, and the ones who were seronegative to start with was forty three point two. Yes. So it's a pretty crummy vaccine if you haven't already had the virus. And I think it needs to be good for seronegative kids, right? Well, or any kind of recipients. That's any what's any kind of recipients that, that should yeah. be good at this. Yeah, where, you know, if you're a traveler or military person or something and you're getting this vaccine, but you've never seen it before. Yeah. This actually is going to, I'm sure, weigh heavily in Sanofi's discussions about whether to pursue approval for this. Right. Because if it's only really useful for um, kids in poor countries who already had dengue, um and you were hoping to pay for these massive development costs and 20,000 patient trials that you footed the bill for yep. uh, by selling it to travelers in the military, um, that's not going to work. So let's let's imagine if you use this vaccine, if it were licensed, and let's say you have very low titers against type 2. Um, when you get infected with type 2, instead of it being blocked, it may replicate. And then you may get a memory response to the other serotypes, and that's going to give you serious dengue. Right. So that's uh, the, But they didn't see that. They didn't see that. They didn't right. see it. They it, and that was that was another important aspect of this study and the Asian study was that they looked for this. Uh, I mean, the worry with something like this is if you've got variability in the antibody titers or somebody doesn't get a complete response, um, that you're going to get this uh, this secondary, you know, far worse disease, um, which I think used to be called dengue shock syndrome. I don't know what yeah. it's called now, but like severe um, dengue. Yeah. Severe dengue. Um, so so they've looked for that in both of these big trials, and they, it doesn't seem to increase the risk for that. I don't understand why it doesn't. I don't either. Yeah, but it's <laughs> clear there's some difference between wild natural dengue and this vaccine-induced uh, in immunity. But it may right. be that if you go to much bigger numbers, like millions, then... Could, and it may be that. that even in the people who weren't previously exposed, you know, we're talking about efficacy numbers of in the in the 30s and 40s, but maybe maybe people are developing, even the people who've got not terribly useful antibody titers, at least it's enough that it prevents this uh, this sort of erroneous memory yeah, response. Yeah. But that's just hand waving. So they say here this um, one of the other things they say is the first evidence that efficacy varied according to serotype despite similar antibody levels. So again, mm-hmm. similar neutralizing antibodies but mm-hmm. different protection, which suggests that maybe boosting the amount of type two in yeah. there won't make a difference. Mm-hmm. It says that this highlights the need for large multi-center phase three trials to in- test investigational dengue vaccines in heterogeneous epidemiologic settings. So I wonder. I wonder. You know, I'm really going off here. I'm wondering how <laughs> efficacy actually relates to this uh, uh, enhancement of disease, the serotype specific enhancement of disease. I wonder if you can uh, be immunized and just get a little bit of an antibody response enough to take care of that problem. Uh, without necessarily fully protecting you against uh, dengue type 2. I wonder if you could have a vaccine that would be okay in terms of preventing uh, the shock syndrome, okay, but not necessarily fully protect you against individual serotypes. Maybe that's what we're seeing here, right? Yeah, it could be. Because you make antibodies, you make neutralizing antibodies defined by a cell culture. Maybe that is enough. And you do see um, very impressive efficacy against severe dengue. 
Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk of- about the difference between they they assayed. Did they assay all of these kids for serum antibodies or just a subset? No, just a subset. Just a subset. Uh, and and so was the serological response uh, much greater than you s- in terms of percentage of kids showing a serological response greater than the efficacy? Do you have a higher percentage of the kids? I mean, efficacy is dis- defined as whether or not you get disease, right? Right. Right. Uh, so did you have... Uh, apparently, kids who were well it depends on whether or not they're exposed. I yeah. think well, if okay, you look so at it's hard to judge. Um, it, if you look at the um, well, all they tell us, and I'm sure the data are here, but all they tell us is that uh, if you got the vac- at least one dose of vaccine, you made uh, you antibodies made antibodies against all four serotypes. Okay, right? so it could be that regardless of the overall efficacy getting uh, an immune response is enough to uh, protect you against the really crummy disease. Right. So what was the death rate in children receiving placebo from dengue? There, there, were, were, there, there were no dengue, dengue okay, deaths. So, no so dengue deaths. that means that you, you didn't immunize enough people to include them into this cohort to see whether or not Rich is hypothesis was really right or not well but by breaking out the severe dengue cases i think yeah. you're getting at that problem because yeah. those are the so. ones who are at risk of death mm-hmm. but you know i've been doing some reading on dengue also by the way and uh, without treatment without supportive treatment the death rate from severe dengue is about 50 percent but with supportive therapy which doesn't attack the viral infection at all it's only around two percent okay so, yeah, so you you would argue we should have seen yeah but there are only 11, 12 well, cases of severe dengue in, in this whole the trial. In the more developed countries that this was uh, tried in, uh, they would get good supportive therapy yeah, sure. when they got sick, so they sure. wouldn't die from it even though... I would actually expect that everybody would. enrolled in this clinical trial would get right. at least reasonably good sure. uh, supportive therapy just because that's ethically required. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I would agree. I would so agree. That, that would explain low number of deaths, but I, I think this... Um, this efficacy against severe dengue is actually the real, the real gem here, um, because frankly, I think we've talked about this with flu vaccine. Most people don't care whether they have a virus or not. Right. Yes. They care what the virus does to them. Right. Yeah. So if you have a vaccine that is that is eh, effective against dengue, yeah, you might get the virus, but you know what? It's really effective against you getting hospitalized mm-hmm. with the virus. Yeah, the argument mm-hmm. there is identical to the uh, clinical trials with malaria vaccines that didn't prevent infection but seemed right. to lessen the severity of the disease. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, the- so so we can we can Solve Sanofi's problem for him right here. I hope they're listening. <laughs> okay, if you were to travel to a dengue uh, endemic country, right. would you take this vaccine? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Sure. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Sure. Problem solved. License sure. it. Yeah. Um, I, I see. I, I see no no bad outcomes. You know that right. are going on here, and there's not not really much risk in getting it. That's right. And it could save your life. Indeed. And, and we should point out that in this, these 12 cases of severe dengue, three were serotype 1, four were serotype 2, and three serotype 3, one serotype 4. So there were four of mm-hmm. two. Mm-hmm. And even though you have very low um, efficacy against in preventing infection, right. it, it did prevent severe type 2 disease. Bingo. So I think um, you can look at that part as being positive, right? Yeah. I was trying to figure out the death rate in a kind of a back of the envelope calculation on the CDC page they say there's 22,000 deaths mostly among children per year with 50 to 100 million infections yes, so that comes out to be less than 1% 0.00044 <laughs> exactly um, and that times the 28,000 yeah yeah um would be a prediction. Now oh, I got a different number this time, so don't <laughs> trust these numbers. It might be around twelve, but as you said, that they would get a lot of supportive therapy. So zero, zero four five. How much difference was the efficacy in the zero negative uh, kids? I, I don't see those data. Okay, they're here. Yeah, I've got to. They're them. they've got them. It's in, is it in the table? See. Let's it's see. In, I've got it in the discussion. 
higher efficacy was observed in children with a seropositive status at baseline than in those with a seronegative status, 83.7% versus 43.2%. And then... Substantial. Yes. Um, but uh, Okay, so yeah, that's fine. Those on, numbers are good. It's on page okay. 118, the middle of the left-hand column. Okay. Now, it's interesting... Um, there's a commentary that accompanies this by Stephen Thomas called Preventing Dengue. Is the possibility now a reality? And they go through the results, um, and they, they speculate on why type 2 might you know, have been so low in efficacy and so forth. But um, <clears throat> in the end, it, they say... Um, it remains to be seen whether licensure will be sought on the basis of these data and what effect this could have on future attempts to conduct efficacy trial with different vaccine candidates. Yes. So he's saying basically that if this is licensed, maybe it'll be really hard to develop another vaccine, but mm -hmm. maybe another vaccine could be better. You know, so that's quite interesting. Whereas in the paper uh, itself, in the end, uh, they say something which is quite telling, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they say... All right, scroll back. Post-licensure studies and robust surveillance will be necessary. So the Sanofi authors are saying, after this is licensed, we'll have to do this. Right. <laughs> so I think they would like to license it, obviously. So why does the licensure of this uh, make it more difficult to pursue another vaccine? First of all, there'd already be a big player in your market. Right. And secondly, from a biological standpoint, if you're vaccinating huge swaths of the population and they're now developing antibodies against this, um, you may have trouble demonstrating efficacy in that population. Right. You may not have enough incidence of, uh, of severe disease, okay. which would be good, but it, then you'd have to do an even bigger study to be able to demonstrate efficacy. So what happened with the polio vaccine is that Jonas Salk's IPV was licensed in 1955. At the same time, you know, Albert Sabin was developing his vaccine. And then at the end of the 50s, Sabin went to the U.S. Public Health Service. I have this vaccine, which I think is better. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we don't care. We have a vaccine. We have a vaccine, yeah. And so he went to the Soviet Union, you know, and put it in millions and millions of kids because he had a friend there who let him do that. And that, that was why it got licensed. But it, yep. it's hard to do that in this case, obviously. So here's a trivia. There's no Soviet eat. Union for one. Here's a trivial fact. <laughs> Who was the first person to isolate dengue virus? I answer, Albert Sabin. Really? Oh. No kidding. Really? How hmm. did you know that, Dixon? Because I've been reading. I told you I've been reading. Hmm. Dangerous when you read. Is this like the first time on TWIV that you've been reading? <laughs> no, it's just the first time I, I chose to reveal the fact that I've been reading. Actually, How's that? <laughs> it says here that, not, that he didn't do it. What does it say? All right. This is from a, a website called Sci Citable, Citable, which yeah, is a Citable. nature uh, website. That's right. Yeah, that's right. All right, so I'm on Citable. And you scroll down to the references. Hang on, dude. I'm, I'm going to read the actual thing. So it was the, dis the disease was described first by other people, but the virus itself was isolated. In 1943, right. Ren Kimura and that's Susumu right. Hata first isolated dengue virus. Well, keep These reading. These two scientists were studying blood samples of patients taken during the 1943 dengue epidemic in Nagasaki. A year later, Albert Sabin and Walter Schlesinger independently isolated Thank you. dengue. Thank you. So, okay. I don't know, a year later, forget it. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> then why did they choose to mention that then? Because uh, Sabin and Schlesinger are well known, mm. probably. I don't know. I guess a year is okay. They're both yeah, on the pretty track. Pretty close. Pretty close. But um, who yeah. was one of the first people to isolate Dave? <laughs> 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 well, it's interesting that you would see. You probably didn't remember the other authors, right? So you not. said Schle Sabin. And what I did think was striking about it was notice when it was isolated in Nagasaki. Forty-three. Yeah, I guess what happened to Nagasaki. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is that, what year was that? That was 1945. That was 45. 45, yeah, yeah later. Two years okay. later. Yeah, after that, they wouldn't be isolating anything for a while. No. Right? no. no. Isotopes of uranium. <laughs> okay, so that's the uh, phase three. And um, hmm. I don't know. We'll see if it's so uh, is, licensed. Is this a right? good vaccine for the Army? 
look, they should take it. You know, they I know, should, yeah. I know people who have gone to tropical countries and they get dengue, they get yeah. primary dengue, right. which is not so bad. A lot of them come back to New York. So in New York, there's a thriving, yes. people recognize it right away. So, oh, where were you, Puerto Rico? You have dengue. Yep. And they're afraid to go back, right? I so know, for them, this is right. perfect, right? Exactly right. right. We even had one of our fourth-year medical students that took medical elective in the tropics when I was the director of that program who came back from, in fact, Puerto Rico with breakbone fever. Breakbone fever. So while looking uh, for this paper, I came across a second paper on broadly neutralizing antibodies against dengue, and we've decided that we'll give that an episode of its own because it's really cool. Mm -hmm. right, superficially, it's cool. yeah, superficially, it looked like a, a quick, you know, thing that we would note on the side with this. But then once yeah. you start reading the paper, you realize that this is a, this is a whole other so world. So the paper. It gets you into the structure of the virus and its different forms, and it's really and it goes into neutralizing assays and what might not be right. So I think it's really relevant to do it. It's very right. interesting. I have a, yeah, a non-virologist question yeah. for all the virologists yeah. out there, and that is: there are four strains of dengue. There always have been four strains. Serotypes, of dengue. you mean? Right? Serotypes. Yeah. Why aren't there more? Because it obviously undergoes lots of mutations, just like other viruses, and that could lead to new antigenic types. But there are only, only three serotypes of polio, Dixon. That's and have you got the answer for that question? I don't have an answer because there's only one serotype of a bunch of other yeah, but you uh, RNA flu, viruses. For instance, Measles. We know what, what's Measles. going on for recombination and stuff, but I, you just wonder why it's so stable. You're not allowed to ask the why question. Yeah, no yeah. why. Can you rephrase um, it so that's not why? Yeah, how come? Well, there must no. be a bottleneck somewhere, Dixon. That, there must uh, a bottleneck. A bottleneck. I like that word. Yeah, I mean a mutation that results in an unfunctional virus. Maybe. Yeah, there's some there's some constraint on the uh, yeah. I wish we the knew antigens what it was. that uh, that only allows it to diversify sure. into four serotypes. But you know what? Other flaviviruses have lots of various ser serotypes. West Nile has like 28, maybe more. Yeah. And it's totally related to this one. So. It got past whatever whatever dengue is. Yeah, but why are there four? Yeah, like, why right. not just one? That's that was weird. my question. Not so you got polio, you got that's three. Right. This you have four. Why yeah. a sure. number of viruses have just sure. one? But why four? Exactly. And it's not even a prime number. And, why nine? And throughout yes. the world, I mean, this is like everywhere. This the insect vectors vary, the people's genetics varies, and yet it's still four. Interesting. Huh? Let's do some email. Yeah, we have more questions. Then answers. Kathy, can you take the first one, please? Sure. Anthony writes, I'm attaching a spreadsheet from the state of New Jersey for rabies statistics. There are many cases in raccoons for the year 2013. Even looking at a 10-year period, there are extremely few in possums. The Virginia possum is a very common <laughs> is very common in New Jersey and may be found in the same environment as the raccoon, my street in Jersey City, for instance. Curiously similar is that for bat-borne virus outbreaks in Australia, those stricken were people and other placental mammals, not the native marsupials. Quote, during the initial epidemic epi study of Hendra virus, limited number of marsupials were surveyed, but they were all negative for Hendra. And he's quoting Lin Fa Wong. Um, I don't know if that's from, did he say that on the TWIV? I don't, I don't remember. Know. Anyway, it appears that there's another connection between marsupials and bats. Both have lower body temperatures than other mammals, marsupials at all times, and bats when not flying. As noted in one of your podcasts, bats are difficult model animals. That's no, not so for possums. Road kills are readily available. I wonder if, like bats, they might carry viruses but be asymptomatic. They just pretend to have rabies. Uh, <laughs> Those are not anyway, road kills. <laughs> he sent the uh, New Jersey document. He sent, and we have that and a link. And, then, and it looks like um, mm. uh, Dixon, you're in. What are you in Bergen County? Yes. So there were 439 uh, animals there with rabies. So what county are you in, Vincent? Union. Union. Uh, so Union weighs in at um, uh, 135. Hard to follow across. 135. Oh, so Dixon wins. <laughs> <laughs> but the right highest there. one He's foaming is, at the mouth as we speak. <laughs> highest one is five ninety nine in I've got six Morris. ten six ten in Burlington. Burlington. I don't know what any of that means. I think I read recently that New York State recorded some twenty five thousand cases in raccoons over one year period. Which wow. was an enormous number actually. For the last five years there have been an average of sixteen cats infected with rabies annually in New Jersey. Wow. 
I guess they have this helpful footnote that cats have accounted for 90% of the domestic animal cases in New Jersey since 1989. Interesting. So I just mm. clicked, because I wondered how easy it might be to deal with possums, and uh, it was a document that downloaded. Um, I'm waiting for it to re- they are not. They are not friendly animals. <laughs> no, yeah. uh, it says they're they're very high maintenance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so even though you might find them as roadkill, that wouldn't be how yeah. you'd want to do no, your no. experiment. You want that, that would be the preferable way to interact with them. Actually, I mean, the problem here is that we've got a lot of deadly viruses from bats, and that's why people are are interested. And in. we don't have anything from. Sure. I did find a paper, Dixon, where they I, isolated. West Nile virus, or they got seropositive yeah, WNV yeah. from a, a possum, yeah. so that maybe they're yeah. infected, right? Yeah, sure. But um, I think that I'm sure they have viruses, but none of them have apparently gone into people yet. So it's a good right. thing it's not orally transmitted, or some of my kinfolk might be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this spreadsheet is really cool, and stay away from raccoons. Yes, yeah, stay yeah. away from raccoons, yeah, especially the, if you're a that's cat. That's the big lesson. And you don't have to tell me to stay away from skunks, but, <laughs> yeah. but stay you know, away some from people raccoons. befriend them and they feed them and they yep. let them come into their homes. And yeah. Not a not it's a good idea. Kind of crazy, I think. Rich, can you take the next? Uh, that's yeah, um, I can try. Gerson. Gerson. Gerson writes, "Dear sir, uh, there are certain viral diseases." Which are said to have had, uh, which are said to have no cure. Ah, one of these is hepatitis B. Since there is no cure for hepatitis B, if the antiviral medicines cannot eliminate the virus, how can they reduce the viral load? What do these antiviral medicines actually do to the virus? Um, uh, uh, are these your notes here? Yeah, I, I looked this up. So there are a bunch of antivirals. Most of them are hitting DNA synthesis. Right. And they work. They inhibit viral DNA synthesis. They reduce viral loads. And if you have uh, liver disease, you're supposed to take them. Right. If you have, um, if you don't have liver disease, they actually they don't give them to you. And if you have acute uh, hepatitis B, they don't give them to you because it'll resolve. But if you have liver disease, you take these antivirals. They do knock down viral load. Um, I don't know... You know, I don't know what, what fraction of people they actually eliminate virus, if that's possible at all. I don't know if you can do that because, you know, there's the close circular DNA in the nucleus and that stays there unless the cell dies. The main problem with these are, is resistance hmm. uh, because they're used as monotherapy, so you get resistance pretty quickly. Right. But um, so the, the way they work, NUC is uh, nucleoside analogs. That's what they call it. <laughs> Nuke. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's from Fields. Um, they You have to use it if you have liver symptoms. So if you have elevated liver enzymes, then you have to take uh, these antivirals. And I, I don't know what fraction, I mean, I don't know what fraction of people end up being cured or, or what, but I think they substantially reduce your chance of getting liver cancer. So that's good in itself, even if they don't yeah, get absolutely. rid of the virus entirely, right? That's it's, what I yeah. know just from yeah, Fields. Sure, sure, sure. Hey, do you know anything, Rich? No, that's consistent with what I know. And it's interesting that, I mean, it is important to consider that uh, hepatitis B can either cause an acute or a chronic infection. If it causes an acute infection, goes away, you're, you're fine. Yeah. No need yeah. to treat you. And um, in the case of the uh, chronic infection, I guess it, it makes sense that you, you, you treat people who have uh, liver disease. I I don't quite understand the rationale if you're obviously a carrier but not symptomatic? Um, Why not worth, treat those people? It's worth pointing out oh. that these drugs, um, many of them have horrible, horrible side effects. Yeah. Okay. Um, the interferons in particular um, can cause just absolutely horrible depression, and it's entirely drug-induced. Mm. So, you know, you, you cause a psychiatric problem in a patient that didn't otherwise have one. That's never right. a good thing. Um, and, and other, there are other side effects of them as well. But um, this is this is not something that you want to just hand out. Dixon, can you take? I knew you'd ask me to. Anthony's. This one. You like sure. short ones, right? I love short ones. So Anthony writes: <clears throat> Virus scare at CDC points to more problems with lab animals, and then he gives a website um, link to that. And the question that he wants to know is. Was this or will this be covered at uh, some later time in TWIV? 
I will cover it right now, Dixon. Let's do that. This is not a new story. So no, this is a not. Business Week, business um, week. story from September, which is about a. It's it's so basically when you do an animal experiment and you want to infect them or do any animal experiments, you have to have an IACUC uh, proposal and it has to be approved. Institutional a- Animal Care and Use Committee has to look at it, and you can't you can't vary from it. You can't use a different virus. No. do different things, okay? So apparently what happened was Charles Ruprecht, who we know because he's a rabies guy and he wrote the TWIV a while ago. He's published on rabies. Um, he was accused of using viruses that weren't on his protocol. So apparently he got fired. This is all documented at a CDC page, actually. they I found uh, in this article a link to um, the CDC page, Rabies Researcher Violated Institutional Protocols. And um, they, they describe what happened there. You know, he was using some non-street rabies viruses in, in non-human primates. So that you can't do that. And he says it's because someone didn't like him and they caught him and did this. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I don't. I'm not sure that this is of any interest at all. I think this happens a lot, and uh, most of the time the people modify their protocol and that's the end of it. So I don't know yeah. why this is of is newsworthy. But you know, in the current climate where uh, people are finding NIH and CDC doing wrong things. I guess they want to find more wrong things, right, Alan? Right. I think the hype here is <laughs> yeah. that, this, that this guy did something that was illegal, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and so what happened here, I mean, first of all, if the if the charge is false, then this is all just, um, you know, maybe Ruprecht's story is accurate, and, uh, and he had a, a boss at the CDC who wanted him gone, and this was the mechanism used. Uh, that sort of thing does happen when people interact, even in large organizations. Um, I think we can probably all understand that concept. Oh, no, I've never seen that. <laughs> um, the, the other possibility is, or, or another possibility, is that this is, this is a completely valid charge, that he really did do this, um, in which case you can look at this, I would look at this as an example of the system working. So you have a protocol, you have somebody who violated the protocol, and he, when that was found out, he was fired. According to the CDC site, he did violate the protocol. Yeah, and, I mean, this uh, is CDC paperwork yeah. that Business Week um, got through Freedom of Information Act. Yeah, it's on the um, CDC site, too, now. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, in, in either case, you're not dealing with something that indicates any kind of... Um, procedures or, or a systematic issue there, I mean, you're either dealing with internal politics, which would be unfortunate, uh, or you're dealing with a case where the system worked. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other possibility is that the truth is somewhere in between. <laughs> so this happened in 2012, by the way. This is, um, hmm. The incident, the violations occurred between 2006 and 2009. Yeah. The, the, the CDC, CDC says it only learned about them in 2012. Yeah. Um, so that that might have been, you know, when either the jealous boss wanted him gone or when the, um, the investigators finally yeah. caught up to what had been done wrong, depending on whose side of the story you want to believe. There's some interesting stuff about allegation number two, which was whether or not they applied humane euthanasia at the appropriate times. And if you read quite far down about that, staff consistently indicated during interviews that the non-human primates were euthanized when clinical signs of rabies infection were observed. Um, but then I Cook noted that two non-human primates were found dead in their cages, mm. um, and I Cook said, but no, observe, the time between observable signs of Ill- illness and death could be as short as six hours and could occur between the observational periods. So that's just one of the allegations, but you can see that there had to be a lot of investigation going on and, and decisions made. So yeah. you can check it out in detail. But. Yeah. Uh, you just can't mess with this stuff. No. Right. Because, but I'm surprised um, that the article came out in Business Week first rather than in Monkey Business Week. Oh. <laughs> Takes it. Sorry. It's, I don't get a chance to speak that much on this show. So I just <laughs> you you get a chance to speak it's whenever you want. <laughs> whenever you want, you can well, talk. I seem to have nothing to say then. How's that? <laughs> you have plenty to say. In fact, whenever you say something, it's... It's mm, something. It's, it is, thank you. <laughs> Alan, could you take Mikhail's email? Sure. Mikhail writes, Hello, dear TWIV team. Vincent, Alan, Dixon, Rich, Kathy, and all folks that have been or will have been on the show. <laughs> right. There's somebody who yeah. covers everything. Exactly. That's good. Exactly. 
Uh, first, I would like to ex express my sincere appreciation for your enormous undertaking in enlightening the public about microbiology in general and viruses in particular. I recently started to listen to TWIV and completed a 112 episodes in about three months. Your podcasts make my morning runs not only physically but also mentally healthy. I've recently set my personal record for marathon while listening to episodes discussing Ebola virus. I'll get to that later. Also, a half, half an hour commute is now filled with knowledge rather than boredom. I got my PhD in virology in Russia studying tick-borne encephalitis. Good place to study that. And then worked on yellow fever virulence and attenuation and murine CMV uh, role in cardiovascular disease at Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center in Shreveport. This year I started to teach full-time at Lakeland Community College near Cleveland, Ohio. My colleague and I recently were chosen to present about Zaire, the Zaire Ebola virus outbreak, um, and your podcasts were immensely useful in preparation for this venue. Our presentation had a great reception, and I was able to give detailed answers to the questions that you had already discussed on the show, for example, vaccines. So thanks a bunch for your help. In episode 112, you discussed the education gaps in U.S. college students. As a community college teacher, I can testify that the lack of basic natural science education in high school takes its toll at the college level. Coming from quite a different education system, I would suggest that having mandatory basic courses in chemistry, physics, and biology that are focused on the foundations of these disciplines rather than on the details will be of a great benefit for future students. Science is hard, and I suspect that this plays a role in the fact that high school students refrain from taking science courses, leaving them for college. And college science is even harder. Thank you for taking time to read my email. You're doing an excellent job and a great service. Um, best regards, Mike. And uh, yes, it would be, uh, I think everybody who, has, uh, who is involved in science education at any level has basically agreed that mandatory basic courses in chemistry, physics, and biology focusing on foundations instead of details would be a tremendous benefit in the American system. Uh, the only problem is that all of the people who have the power to implement that uh, mm -hmm. have not agreed with that. Yep. Plus, you'll have difficulties recruiting qualified teachers, to begin with at least, because nobody's trained to do that. Which is one of the reasons that the people with the power to change it have not agreed to that change. <laughs> exactly. So I want to raise something here. He says, science is hard. Hmm. And certainly that's everybody's impression. I'm wondering if that's really true. Okay? It doesn't seem hard to me, <laughs> but of course I've been at it for a while. But but I really wonder whether it can't be communicated in a fashion. Because I don't really think it's all that difficult. The underlying process of science is not difficult, is not a difficult concept at all. I don't it's even think, you know, like molecular <laughs> biology is, you know, the, the, the sort of the essential chemistry and stuff that you need to understand the central dogma and the structure of a cell, it seems to me, is not all that difficult. Immunology is hard. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a chemical language. Uh, I'm thinking about this among other things, uh, Vincent. In the Brazil broadcast, mm. somebody asked you when you were going to write the book that everybody could understand. Because mm. I've been thinking a lot about this. <laughs> okay, so m my question is: Could you write a book that's you know 200 pages long that anybody could understand that would describe how cells work? And how genetics works. Of course, you I can. think you can. Sure, you know, you, you know you can. Yeah, I think so. Without losing the essence of the, the the uh, sophistication of the knowledge. And so, one of the problems is that that there's this preconception that science is hard. So, if you're in high school or something, you say, "Oh no, I don't have to take chemistry. That's hard." Well, I think that it, some people don't find it hard, and others do. And I think it's probably in part because they don't have a good teacher. Yes. Who doesn't yeah. teach it in I a way that would that. Right. make it easier, but still, sure. e you know, teaching them something. I, I, mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. So it maybe, also, mm -hmm. so maybe what really needs to be worked on here is, uh, and I don't know how much of this might already be done, is coming up with a curriculum. All right, that as he says, teaches the fundamentals or the foundations, yeah. rather than just a bunch of detail. We've talked about this before as well. Coming up with an appropriate curriculum that communicates the fundamentals, without having to be hard yep mm -hmm. other countries have done quite well at that yes our system is not structured the way the systems in other countries are structured i see my kids in, going through middle and high school that's the kind of science they get taught for the most part it's it's just details 
it's it, material that's easy to put on a standardized test. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. I mean, I could make it so much more interesting, right? Yes, yeah, of we course all you could. could. We could sure. all, but uh, sure. we're not the teachers, you know. So right. that's the problem. It's a shame because science is the best thing. We're not and the, the teachers, teachers at that level. The, te- the teachers <laughs> don't have the ability to, to implement the kind of curriculum reform that's really necessary. No, no they can't. So I think what this guy is actually saying, though, is that we are the teachers. Yeah. For the subject of virology, which sure. appears to be an in, on a daunting level, something that no one can understand unless you're a virologist, and and we're making it easy for well, the general public. I think public. it's still hard for a lot of people at our it's level. I think we a lot can of do detail in it, but you know. But I think we make it approachable by showing that virologists don't understand it either. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, I, exactly. and I'm not entirely joking with that. Yeah, that's fine. No, you're, you're right. right. You don't have right. to understand everything to be able to appreciate the significance of something. Right. I'll tell you what's hard. History is hard because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> We're learning right? to play the piano. Science makes sense. <laughs> yes. Well, history, you have to just remember things, right? Yeah, um, I'm no good at that. No, you also <laughs> have to evaluate whose version is correct. Oh, God. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, history, you, history. You can't deny the fact that you need a vocabulary no matter what subject you approach. So right. you need to memorize some things in order to be able to think in terms of that. So I think when they say, here are the 21 amino acids, there's nothing logical about them, Richard, except their backbones. So yeah, then you start so, yeah. adding little R groups on there, and you've got to memorize each one of them separately. Ah, uh, forget it. But you, you can do that. it. Oh, yeah, you, can you can look them up. Basic structure. Egg, you know, that's, I totally agree with you. So medical students have all these little mental tricks. They create these mnemonics, and that's how they remember them. And then 20 minutes later, they've forgotten them and gone on to another set. Uh, but you can recall them. Over time, you can actually come back to that and say, "Oh yeah, I remembered that." It's like an anamnestic response to a second boost with a vaccine. So, so, Kathy, given today that everything is recorded, in the future, will history be less subject to interpretation? <laughs> I don't think so. Why? Because the because mists of time make everything cloudy. You know, if there's an event that happens and five people watch it. There's five different accounts of what happened. Yeah, yeah, but now you've got everything on the internet, right? Which but it, is doesn't, right. it doesn't even matter if there's video. How many cases of police brutality have there been with video and the versions of events do not match up? Or riots so, occur and there's video and the versions of events do not match up. Because even a video is it's... It, it, you, mm-hmm. The person shooting the video chooses to frame a particular part of the scene. Right. And that right away is a statement of opinion. Yeah, that's right. So one last thing here, the um, uh, discipline that re- we've been talking about, history and science and other disciplines, a discipline that really fascinates me is economics, because we created this, but we don't understand it. We don't it. understand it. It has a life of its own. And yet we have had Nobel Prizes for it. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. In hopes that someone will eventually understand it. Next one is from Joaquim, who writes, firstly, thank you for this amazing show and a big shout out to Jesper, who presented me to it. I started listening to podcasts just this spring, and it took me quite a while before finding some that were worth listening to, obviously Twix included. In the end, there are almost only two groups of casts that I really long for, and except for you guys, it's also the History Political Podcast of Dan Carlin, i.e. Hardcore History and Common Sense. So imagine my surprise when Common Sense happened to go into the world of Twee this week in Ebola virus. <laughs> the episode discusses the political play in regards of the West African out- Ebola outbreak. If not as correct as Twee, it still asked some money questions in regards to possibly pandemic virus outbreaks in comparison to other state-related economical posts. So he, he sends a link to that episode. Speaking I'll bet you that's quite good because we have, as, we, as we discussed, a lot of Ebola is political and social right. and so it would be nice okay. to have his spin on that yep. please never stop the awesome work you are doing okay thank you Joaquin mm-hmm. and he is a senior quality assurance engineer in Stockholm mm. P.S. November in Stockholm Sweden has been the grayest and dullest possible with five hours of sun and between three and ten degrees Celsius Oof. oh man that would drive me crazy can you imagine five yeah. hours of sun oh. get a lot of work done Rich. <laughs> or you sleep. <laughs> Kathy, can you take Todd's? Todd writes, greetings, Twivers. While working my way through back episodes, a comment in Twiv number 11 <laughs> about a rat catcher who never used gloves or other precautions for 25 years Eek. got me thinking about sparrow viruses. The common house sparrow in the U.S. is an invasive species, and I've read about people trapping them as a way to help native birds reclaim their territory. 
Are there any viruses commonly found in sparrows that can cause illness in humans? How might they be transmitted? I'd love to hear your thoughts on your insights on this and hope my question gives you an opportunity to talk about zoonotic illnesses. I know Best one. Talk. I know one. Go ahead, Please Dixon. let me go. <laughs> West Nile virus. Dixon's got his hand up. <laughs> I can does, see it. Does, it is. He, he does. does. He's <laughs> waving it. <laughs> okay. That's the one I know about. West Nile, yeah. Yes. I do know this, though. When the Chinese decided to get rid of sparrows because they were actually pooping all over the public uh, statuary of. Uh, Tiananmen Square and other places like that, uh, the rate of encephalitis went through the roof the next year because sparrows were eating the mosquitoes that were tra- transmitting it. So, so that's they, one way of transmission. It would be from the sparrow by a mosquito to people, right? That's right. But the mosquitoes were being eaten by the mos- by the sparrows. Yeah, right. So the sparrows were eating mosquitoes and controlling encephalitis in this case. Not West Nile in this case. It was uh, Japanese bee encephalitis. Well, there's probably... I mean, there, if you just do a PubMed search, you can find lots yeah. of viruses in sparrows. I Absolutely. don't know. Aside but she from wanted to which ones could transmit to humans. Yeah, as most well. of them have to do with West Nile. There's some influenza right. virus. Right. Uh, right. So who knows? Maybe, yeah. maybe one day we'll see a new one come from sparrows. Exactly. Yeah, the hit came up with two hundred something. When you eat your mm-hmm. sparrow, mm-hmm. sparrow virus, sparrow virus, sparrow yeah. virus on PubMed, yeah. Yeah, two hundred thirty. You'd have to go into the starlings and the pigeons and those other. Now that's not two hundred thirty-seven viruses. A lot of those are from West Nile. Yeah, Yeah, just hits. Right. All right, Kathy. This is a good idea. What's that? Provide listeners with a link to PubMed for those listeners who are not already familiar with this. Sure. uh, All of the literature that we talk about is on this. PubMed site. Yeah, I try and link to PubMed yeah. as much as I can. But just knowing that you can, you yourself can just go to PubMed and and type yeah. in a couple of search terms. Yeah, yeah it's yes. easy. Then and you, that's, explore, you know, you when also, somebody when something comes up, there's some uh, something you see on Facebook about uh, you know some issue. You can find out what the real literature is by going to PubMed. Much better than googling it. Yeah. Yes. And and you can, um, for listeners who haven't been to PubMed, you should also look at the advanced search tab because there's all sorts of stuff you can do to, to track down literature. Rich, you're next. Oh, Jen writes, hello, TWIF team. I'm a Ph.D. candidate at the University of Georgia specializing in wildlife disease. My dissertation explores the epidemiology of a novel orthomyxovirus in sea ducks, I started listening to your podcast several months back as I prepared for my qualifying exams. Now, that's an interesting preparation for your qualifying exams. Oh. I enjoy them tremendously and often listen during my lengthy commute. I'm excited that you covered several wildlife disease, disease issues recently, sea otters and sea stars. It's a great field of study, and I was glad to see it acknowledged in a favorite venue. I have one small con- Oh, this is interesting. I have one small comment yes. regarding episode 315 mm-hmm. where you discussed the sea star wasting disease. Dr. Spindler was very excited about the use of the word extirpate. <laughs> the definition you referred to is the common language definition of root out and destroy completely. In the field of wildlife management, the word extirpate has an alternate but very important meaning. It means localized extinction. Hmm. True extinction is the complete die-out of a species. Extirpation is the dying out of a population or species within one location. If you reread the sentence with that definition, it has greater significance than simply a linguistic flair. I don't mean to be too critical. It's not mm-hmm. something that a specialist in another field is likely to come across, but I thought the information uh, would add clarity. Keep up the great work. Mm-hmm. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. That's Excellent. really great, Jen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's cur- currently 49 degrees Fahrenheit in uh, Athens. The Weather Channel tells me it's partly cloudy, but I wouldn't know. I'm a graduate student. I haven't seen the sun in months. <laughs> and actually, I know today, uh, not Athens, but somewhere else in Georgia, they're they're in the single digits. So, Ow. Yeah. Can you imagine if you were a graduate student in Stockholm? Yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't be any different. But no. that's, a, that's a, a really interesting use of that term. I really like that. Mm-hmm. Yep, I didn't know. And don't worry uh, about being critical. Everybody else is, no. so it's okay. Heck, we learned something. No, it was informative, not critical. It's fine. No, totally uh, it reminds me of, I use the, I, I think I have been taught to use the words with respect to getting rid of a viral or infectious disease, eliminate and eradicate. 
in a similar fashion, where eradicate uh, implies global riddance of the disease, whereas eliminate ex- uh, implies a geographically local riddance of the disease. Right. All right. And Dick- my my Sorry. three dictionaries don't give the kind of definition that she has, so it's a specialist definition. Oh, absolutely. We if would, you look we up, know that. If you look up, uh, I I just taught this this morning. I was wow. talking about virus tropism. Okay, mm-hmm. where what cells or what tissues it homes to. Right. If you look up tropism in a dictionary, you can't find that anywhere. It's all about flowers orienting to the sun. <laughs> yeah, that's right. True. Interesting. That is true. Interesting. Yeah. Dixon, you're next. Good. Aileen writes, Hi, everybody. I had a weird case at my work this month. A patient who lives at a rural area during a week drank water from a water reservoir where a bat was found dead. Bat juice? Well, (laughs) at the moment that this case was introduced to me, I was in doubt to install rabies post-exposure prophylaxis since no oral transmission was described. But rabies kills. Vaccines don't, I suppose. What do you twiv... <laughs> twiv <bullens? laughs> Think about that. Is there a chance... It's the first time we've been called that. Is there a chance to transmit? Is there an oral vaccine in Fox? Isn't it? No, I'll read that again. There is an oral vaccine in foxes, is, aren't there? <laughs> P.S. I work with the zoonotic surveillance in South Brazil. I'm waiting for the result of bat rabies tests. Vaccinate. Definitely. Definitely. Vaccinate, I would say yeah. vaccinate. There's no harm in that. And it could die, so yeah. you might as well vaccinate. Yeah, yeah there's, no, there's no documented uh, oral transmission, but if you're drinking water from a reservoir where a bat was found dead, there are bats in the area, you had contact with the water, uh, you, eh. Do it. Yeah. So the 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 foxes uh, we talked about the the wild vaccines that are dropped in the woods and they they're eaten by the animals and That's they're right. immunized they contain a rabies vaccine so yeah right. you can immunize that way. Uh, I think the last one should be taken by um, by Rich Condit. Uh, the, I just want to say that that uh, oral vaccination of the foxes is not relevant to uh, rabies oral transmission. Oh, that's right. Because right. right. that's a recombinant that's right. pox virus vaccine. Is, are they all recombinant pox viruses? Yes. None of them are attenuated the only rabies. Ones I, yeah. The only ones I know of, and, and this is remarkable because these were uh, the ones used in the wild. These were absolutely some of the first recombinant vaccines made. And so they are just the rabies uh, envelope glycoprotein slammed into the thymidine kinase yeah. gene of an otherwise <laughs> okay Copenhagen strain. Uh, no attempt to cripple it right. uh, at all. But the uh, compromise of the TK gene with the insertion of that gene does attenuate to some extent. And all of these animals in a while can just chew that stuff up. They get a huge dose of uh, recombinant pox virus mm-hmm. and they just shrug it right off. And they, But it, they do get infected. Yeah. But it doesn't cause any sim- uh, symptomology. Okay. Uh, it doesn't cause any signs. Yeah, uh, signs, and, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Rich. Uh, and, they get, uh, and they get immunized. Well, I don't know. What does the fox say? Uh, <laughs> That's a very good mm, point, Rich. Ask Aesop. Because uh, <laughs> Aline was under the impression that it was rabies oral, but it's a very, it's very good point. But still, I would immunize. Yeah, but not with the Fox vaccine. Give your right. patient the human no, vaccine. No, regular human <laughs> vaccine. Rich. So, uh, Robin writes, current wet, wet bulb temperatures are hard, hard to come by. This has the current wet bulb temperatures for all of Florida, including Gainesville. And it's an, it's an IFAS site. I haven't looked at it yet. Fawn, the Florida Automated Weather Network. Hmm, this is useful. IFAS is our ag school. Hmm. It's a branch of the University of Florida. Or a, yeah. a college within the University of Florida. Ooh, that's so cool. Which county yeah. are you in? Which which is your temperature? Uh, I'm in Alachua. Yeah, but see. what's your temperature? We that has, has no names on it. We just have to know your temperature. Oh, uh, fifty-five. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just moving the mouse this? around North Central Florida. Oh, well, Alachua. Uh, oh, fifty-five. There okay. The wet bulb temperature. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you, Robin. It's always useful. Let's do some picks of the week. Mm-hmm. Alan, what do you have? Uh, I have a book that I just um, just read recently. It was given to me for Christmas, and I read it um, in an afternoon. Um, it's a book <laughs> called The Toaster Project. 
And this, uh, I gather, was originally this fellow's master's thesis at Design School in London. Um, He set out to build a toaster from scratch. Really from scratch. So he... um, and the idea he wanted to to do a thesis on where things come from, you know, where what's involved in this modern world that we've built, and and what what are we doing in extracting all these resources to build common appliances? So he picked something that he figured was simple enough that he might actually be able to build it, a toaster. Um, and then he went and uh, first he he needs some steel to make the frame of the thing. So he talks to a metallurgist and then he goes to uh, one of the oldest iron mines in the world, which happens to be in England. He does all of this without leaving the UK. Um, and he collects iron ore and then he hauls it back to a parking lot outside his school and he tries to smelt it. And he goes through this whole process. <laughs> Uh, then he needs mica insulators and copper wires, and he wants to put a plastic cover over the mm. thing. And um, so he goes through step by step what's involved in mm. in extracting and producing all of these things, and the enormous effort and energy that goes into it. How about that? Um, in, into a device that you buy for ten dollars off the shelf and throw away in a couple of years. And he he ties that into. A bunch of other things. I mean, it's a it's a student thesis um, project, so it's got some weaknesses, and he ends up bending a lot of his own rules along the way. But it's just a very interesting meditation. Cool. Uh, this is this is really good. You can uh, flip through the book on uh, Amazon. Right. Mm-hmm. There's a great figure here <laughs> that is, um, what's it? It's mm-hmm. captioned "Micro Scale Iron Ore Transportation." Yes. And it's yes. a it's a roller bag full of iron ore. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's cool. That's amazing. I'm going to build a virus and write a book about it. <laughs> hey, Rich, by the way, I finished The Martian. I finished a couple of weeks ago. It was great. Yeah, fun, I mean, huh? Everybody should read it. It's, uh, yeah, it's I can't wait really for the good. movie. Really good. But Dixon had poo-pooed it. I said Dixon to read it because it's all Come about on, Dixon, indoor farming. Up, will you? Come on, lighten uh, up. What's wrong with me? <laughs> you should read more, Dixon. <laughs> you know you're right. Kathy, what do you have? Well, I picked... Antarctica, A Year on Ice, which is a uh, documentary, a full film now, uh, by a New Zealand guy. I Hmm. can't remember if we've ever talked about it on TWIV, but my older brother has wintered over at the South Pole several times and has uh, also spent time at Palmer Station and so forth. And so Mm -hmm. uh, we were pretty interested in watching this anyway, but um, Bill knows the director and uh, so this uh, links to his site where there's a trailer, there's also extras, and lots of other images. And one that I think he just posted this week uh, called uh, Penguin Ate My Camera. And it's <laughs> only about That's a minute cute. long. And it's worth checking out. But if you have a chance to see the movie, which we did, it, it came to one of the uh, sort of more art house places here. It was just here for a week last week. Mm-hmm. It's really worth it some of the most beautiful cinematography you'll ever see he's got lots of um time-lapse photography for auroras and clouds and all kinds of things and just i can't say enough about this movie so check it out. nice i look forward to that rich what do you have uh so in the news has been or at least I've been conscious of the next launch of uh, these a SpaceX rocket to supply the International Space Station. So this is privatized space. Um, and uh, in this particular, t- uh, one of SpaceX's uh, goals is to create a reusable rocket. Uh, and part of this uh, upcoming launch is to test their reusable rocket. And I was wondering, I was looking around because I couldn't quite conceptualize what this test was going to look like. And I found a site on space.com that has a little info graphic that shows exactly how it works. Okay, so there's going to be a two-stage rocket uh, where the first stage will uh, blast up and the second stage will then separate from the first and that carries the cargo to the space station then the first stage will try attempt to make a controlled descent using its rocket and land on a platform uh, out in the ocean Mm. uh, off the coast of uh, uh, Cape Kennedy I think uh, or Cape Canaveral it is now Um, and so I've uh, provided a link to that and also a link to the SpaceX site where 
uh, they have a video that shows a test of this same rocket. So this is Flash Gordon, man. Yes. Where uh, it's true. it's a I don't know how they manage to keep these rockets uh, with the attitude correctly. It must be some gyros. crazy wild gyroscopes, yeah, gyros. right? Yeah, uh, that allow these things to back down and land precisely uh, on a target. Did they get so this I to work? This was, they well, not they've got this launch was supposed to go off on mm, earlier this week, like Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Uh, now it's been it was scrubbed because of weather. It's rescheduled for. Uh, Saturday, tomorrow, so by the time we go live, it, it will have either been scrubbed or happened. So I don't know if this test works, but they've, this test will work, but the, certainly if you look at the a video on SpaceX.com, they've got a rocket that will do this. They can launch it up hmm. at least uh, several hundred or several thousand feet and then back it down and land it on a pad again. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Now, the, the interesting thing here is that they say that the, you know, the, the future of uh, space exploration really uh, depends to to a large extent on having reusable rockets. That's correct. Mm. But you know that was the concept behind the space shuttle. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And ultimately, the space shuttle was scrapped because it was easier just to uh, throw up capsules to to do what the shuttle did than it was to recycle the space shuttle. Yeah. More, well, the, la- more the cost initial- effective. Yeah, the initial concept of the space shuttle was that it would be reusable, but they had to attach all those disposable rockets to it to get it to work and then rebuild the thing after every launch, so it wasn't all that reusable. Right. So it basically, economically, as a reusable vehicle, wasn't feasible. I guess right. these guys presumably have done the uh, done their homework on the economics of this thing. But at any rate, I thought the whole technology itself was really interesting, and I'm interested to see why they're I guess they're landing it out they're landing it out on a drone platform that's about as big as a football field right. so as long as a football field about three times as wide uh, that's out on the ocean seems to me that that's a pretty challenging target yeah uh, uh, but I guess they want it away from people so yeah be interesting that's to see if this works failure rate is one in what 65 for rocket <laughs> motors. <laughs> exactly. The for solid equation. rockets. We'll solid rockets. That's okay. right. Oh, this is a liquid rocket. Okay. This is a heck of an experiment. It's interesting that they couple the experiment to make it commercially feasible, I suppose, to a launch that would have happened anyway. Yeah. Right. Dixon de Pommier. I see you have two picks here. Huh? Well, I, I'll just tell you about one of them. <clears throat> Tell um, us both. I think it's cute. The both. Well, the first one was about an outbreak of mumps among penguins. Yes. In this case, <laughs> they were hockey players. Pittsburgh penguins. Pittsburgh penguins. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But I, I thought I would lead into that by saying this is the first example of a virus that's jumped from humans back to birds. Or yeah, he, like he sent me this email, and I go, wow, what's this? <laughs> he got you. Yeah, he got he me, got, too. I got you. I got we, you. Okay. Uh, we did this as a, one of the virus in the news links that we put up for our class site. And uh, <laughs> uh, Beth talked about it the first day of class where she talks about uh, history and and various other things about virology. But it goes back to November 7th when one of the Anaheim ducks first uh, noticed oh. the swelling in his jaw. So and then it, so it's bird. gone all through the <laughs> NHL. Right. Well, are these right. people not immunized? Is that the problem? Um, I can't remember from this article. Uh, I think, um, as far as I know, everybody received immunization when they were young, but uh, there's some evidence maybe that the that it's waning. This is an article by yeah. Yeah. a physician, I think, that we put uh, that we posted. Uh, yeah, assistant professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medical Center. So. Okay. The, so yeah, the, it is becoming evidence that the uh, durability of the mumps, mumps vaccine is not as yeah. great as mm-hmm. originally anticipated. Right. Yeah, I think we talked about that on our mm-hmm. uh, the, on our Athens twiv. Uh, he was yeah. talking about a, an alternate because of the problems. Yeah. What, what's your real pick? Bruce? My real pick is the Andromeda Nebula, which happens to be our closest relative for a galaxy, mm-hmm. um, has been examined in great detail by the Hubble Space Telescope. And they just published their first vision of a portion of Andromeda, a portion, get that right, a portion of the Andromeda Nebula. It is so detailed and so many pixels that you can see individual stars in another galaxy. 
Oh, this Rich. is really cool. If you, Rich, if you click on is, the image and then zoom in You just in keep on the going image, up and up and up, and it doesn't stop. It just doesn't mm-hmm. stop. So I, I'm convinced that since we can now detect exoplanets in our own galaxy, it won't be long before we're doing it in the Andromedic galaxy as well. So, you know, we're, we've gone where no human has gone before. I'm fascinated by anyway. that. I'm absolutely fascinated. And by the way, I must say that the Andromeda Nebula is on a collision course with our own galaxy. So in a couple of hundred billion years from now, it's estimated that we will commingle. Mm. And then if you go online, <laughs> yeah, who is right? <laughs> it ain't so good, though, actually, because what it does is it strips out all the gas. And it flings it into outer space, and as the result, star formation stops. That's your, cool, though, because you know what? galaxy comes to a I, dead end. I'm going to be part of the gas. <laughs> <laughs> we will all be, uh, that's right, we will all be a, 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 a gas by then. A gas. So I get, to, I get to go to the Andromeda galaxy. You do. This yes. is really exciting. You do, you do, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Which I find, I, I'm just, Rich, I'm, I'm with you on this stuff. I am. I've been captured for the moment. I did see my first Captain Midnight episode, and uh, I love it. I just love it. I'll watch every Star Trek that comes on. So you're a Star Trek fan. I am. You don't like Star Wars, huh? You know, Star Wars, you know, wars. When you look at the um, the genre of space... You know, it's one or the other with people, Dixon. That's it is. It is. No, but it, it's one is violent, and the other is a gentle exploration of our I would. I universe. would disagree with that, uh, yeah, Dixon. Yeah. My recollection of Star him. Trek is a lot of violence in Star Trek. I like it, but not at the level of Star Wars. <laughs> uh, it is. It's can be Dixon, worse. I'm Dixon. I'm most of the way through season five on Next Generation. <laughs> I started my retirement early. Oh, good man. Uh, the next in the queue is I Borg. Yeah, yeah where yeah, they yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. where they get a Borg. Yeah, you know, uh, you know. who's been disconnected from the collective. Right. And following that is the Inner Light. <laughs> Where Captain Picard spends a whole lifetime on another planet in about right. thirty seconds. Right, right. great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my pick is a website called We the Microbiologist. This is a website out of India. It's a dot in, and it's run by a bunch of student microbiologists. Basically, they're they they write on the front page. It's a group of young microbiologists, biotechnologists, and other life science. Scientists who collaborate with students, professors, and researchers in a wider platform to meet the essential goals for their studies and research. We look for a fruitful exchange of ideas from young minds to communicate essential goals. So I've been in touch with uh, one of the people who run this site, and um, I thought I would give it a bump. They also have an interview with me. You're on the they cover. Put up. They publish an e-magazine look called uh, Micrographia. I thought I was looking at some famous oh. person. No. And this this is all being done by <laughs> students? Um. I don't know who, what the status. I think the fellow who uh, contacted me might be a student. You know, from students from postdocs. Here, this is Vincent, very impressive. I know that you're not going to believe this, it. but from here, where yeah. I'm sitting, you look like Harold Varmus. You've well, got a Harold Varmus like uh, appeal. I'm not Harold, but I, but um, I know that. But you, you look like him. They they the interviewed thing. me and they sent me a bunch of questions, and I spent a long time answering them. It was actually a lot of fun, mm-hmm. and he did a really nice job of putting it together. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, so the the whole give him a twiv bump. I think they could use some yeah. publicity. Is that your polio with the RNA in it? Yeah, that's the one that uh, <laughs> Ann Palmenberg mm. oh, cool. sent cool. me. It was taken downtown at a studio. It didn't look like the three prime men sticking out, Vincent. No, actually, the yeah. <laughs> that happened in my <laughs> office at a late at a later date. I recognize this, and it, and it turns out that they wrote into twiv two fifty three. Yeah, I thought this was yeah. familiar. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So, so go check it out. Yeah. Uh, we have two listener picks. Neva writes, Hi, Twivers and Twippers. Inventive, but I won't be wearing these. Not as cool as knitted or beaded virus models. Enjoy, Neva from Buda. She sends a link to mosquito earrings. <laughs> They're very cool. cool. I like them because the mosquito is biting the ear. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> is that I a 45 that's degree that's angle? Or is that goes a... through. Exactly. The, the post is the proboscis. The proboscis is the... Oh, what a title. The post is the proboscis. <laughs> for, another, for another day when we talk... Well, today Dixon, are your ears yeah. pierced? Uh, hardly. Oh, gosh. Now, now's the time. Dixon is you old think? school. Yeah, I'm very old school. That's yeah, oh, like, so you know, conservative. It's never and too late. No, I, 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 uh, the other pick is from Basel, who writes, I would like to share this as pick of the week. I hope it gets picked before March 4th, 2015. It's the annual FDA advisory meeting in which the FDA listens to the public scientists and any interested parties. 
in discussing and making recommendations on the selection of strains to be included in the flu vaccine for the year. Next one will be March 4th, 8.30 a.m. for the 2015-2016 flu season. So it gives a link to that. So if uh, you would like to make a suggestion for the flu strain to be included, there you go. I hope Twiv listeners find this useful and pass it along to interested others. I I want to get Stacy schultz cherry on and tell us how this whole process works because she's part of the uh, Mm -hmm. this process she said she'd come on and tell us the whole story that'd be great so we'll do that sometime and that will do it for twiv 319 you can find it at itunes and also at twiv.tv and we love getting your questions and comments you can be critical it's fine we can take it we're (laughs) grown-ups send them to twiv at twiv.tv Dixon de Pommier can be found at hmm, verticalfarm.com. That'll do. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. A little bit terse today, aren't we? You're welcome, Vincent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. I just wanted to add, I mm-hmm. wanted to add the name of the director of that Ann Audrick movie. It's Anthony Powell. I didn't want to get it wrong, and I didn't have it okay. at my fingertips. Anthony he should get Powell. the credit for that being the incredible cinematographer that he is. Cool. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Great always, time. Always a good time. Always a good time. <laughs> Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. It's always a pleasure. See, Dixon, everyone has their own little sign out. Their own little tagline. Except you, you just say thank you. I'm the variant antigen in this group. (laughs) VSG, huh? (laughs) All right. right. I'm troubled at night trying to think of a new way to say goodbye to you guys. I just (laughs) give you hell, Dixon. I'm sorry. It's in a good spirit. Give me heck, you're a friend. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>